everybody. My name is Nick Clinton, Earth Engine Developer Relations. And uh, we're going to talk to you today about a project to map global land cover at higher resolution than ever before. And specifically what I mean by that is mapping the land cover in each 30 meter patch of the Earth back to 2013. So this is a very ambitious project and this kind of uh, a global land cover time series has never been done before. So uh, Earth Engine teamed up with Cloud to make it happen and we're gonna tell you how. But uh, first, you might be wondering, what, a pro. what is land cover? Oh, wait, my mic's on. And the analogy that I like to use is, what's on the shelf? And so uh, uh, organizations all over the world, governments, NGOs, nonprofits, researchers, businesses, want to understand the literal landscape in which they're doing business. So here's a, a more formal definition of land cover. It's the observed physical cover of the Earth's surface, which describes the distribution of vegetation types, water bodies, and uh, human-built environments and other land cover types. Um, that distribution is a map. And so here's a, a map of the imagery that I showed you a couple slides ago. Uh, uh, or rather the pixels are turned into a map. And um, we'd, we'd like to uh, do this at scale and do it not only for the whole surface of the world, but for a time series. And when you have a time series of maps like that, you can start to understand processes like uh, the change in cropland, urbanization, um, deforestation, the change in water resources in your area of interest. And these are not just buzzwords. Land cover is, in fact, codified into the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And um, so uh, Google is interested in helping to achieve these goals. And one of the key ingredients to making that happen is just monitoring and understanding uh, where you are at a given time. And so that's why we need maps like this. Um, in order to get a lot of these at global scale and a time series of them, we need to use a lot of imagery. And, and we need to use a lot of imagery to turn all those pixels into land cover labels uh, like you see in this map. So fortunately, we have Earth Engine to help you with that kind of thing. And um, what is Earth Engine? Earth Engine is Google's cloud platform for geospatial processing and um, it's, it's got a whole bunch of good stuff, primarily uh, raster data, so lots of satellite imagery, but other geospatial data sets as well. And here's an example. This is the same image that you saw before. This is Landsat 8, which is the latest and greatest Landsat. Landsat 9 is coming. But we want to turn all these pixels, and we are right up there somewhere. <laughs> um, we want to turn all these pixels into <laughs> labels. And um, so uh, uh, we have not only images like this, that Landsat image, but we've got lots of other raster and other geospatial data sets that are useful for making those kind of maps. So we have all of Landsat, all of Sentinel from the um, European Space Agency, lots of MODIS data, land cover data, uh, uh, terrain data, um, uh, climate and weather data, so on and so forth, 50 plus petabytes of data in the Earth Engine catalog and growing daily as more scenes come in. All that data is not useful without a computation platform. So the data archive is co-located with Google scale resources to do computation. And that's what you need in order to tackle big machine learning problems like making a time series of those maps uh, all over the world. And uh, to tell you more about the machine learning part of this project is Chris. Take it away, Chris. Thank you, Nick. Hi, my name is Chris Brown, and I'm a engineer on Earth Engine. So you're going to hear a lot about this today, and I'm not going to be the first person to talk about machine learning tools at Google. <laughs> but we do need to talk about them here specifically, because to produce this map, it's a more complicated process than just adding and subtracting some pixels. We actually have to have a little bit of intelligence to do this. So a brief word on, on sort of some of the tools we have to build up 
something like this. We could start with Colab and TensorFlow. You all know TensorFlow. Colab being an IPython notebook environment that's free, provided for, uh, by Google that has things like TensorFlow and GPU backends. So we could train our model this way. We could build a model this way. We can then start to scale our predictions using things like ML Engine, Kubernetes. Um, there's an extreme end we won't talk about today, but if you're an app developer and you don't need to create your own model like we did, you do have things like speech, translate, and other APIs built in. But what we're going to talk about is how we used things like TensorFlow, Colab, and then AI platform to make this land cover map happen. So to build a good model, in our case, we want to model land cover. We need a couple things. We need big data, right? And Nick was talking about this 50 petabytes and growing of data in Earth Engine. We need good models. This is something that's brought to bear by TensorFlow. And then we need a ton of computation, um, some of which is on Earth Engine, but we can't do it all on Earth Engine. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So all right, we understand this is a machine learning problem. Uh, we understand this is a big data problem. But we need to talk about why. <laughs> so if we think for a second about land cover, we can also get a little more specific and talk about land use, right? So if we think about land cover being what stuff is made of, right, on the surface of the Earth, we could use the example of a parking lot and a road, right? They're both made of asphalt, presumably. And if all you knew was that this is made of asphalt, the way we do it is with reflectance, but bear with me here, we know material. Could you tell the difference? Well, you can't, right? It, it doesn't just matter what something's made of. It's the arrangement of that, what it's made of in space. And so this transforms our problem of identifying land cover from looking at a single pixel, looking at reflectance and saying, oh, I know what this is, to looking at many, many pixels and saying we know what this is. Because we don't just need to know the reflectance, AKA the material at one point. We need to know how that's arranged in space. So this turns this machine learning problem into a much heavier problem. Our inputs stop being something like red, green, blue, or in our case, because they're satellites, red, green, blue, ultraviolet, infrared, and a bunch of other stuff, to red, green, blue, ultraviolet, infrared for 64 by 64 or greater patches of pixels. That's a ton of input data. And the question is, do we have the tools to work with this? And the answer is we do. Uh, Earth Engine today, if you didn't already know, does have interoperability with TensorFlow. So you can start to take these images that have spatial context or temporal context and make predictions about them or, or run inference over these images. Um, and this works great. And <clears throat> why, well, why don't we stop here, right? We're done. That should be it. The problem is you can do this over a small region, right? You can run TensorFlow on your machine over these images and make predictions. But things get tricky when you want to scale it. This is an image where, uh, as Nick was describing, 30 meters per pixel. This is of the United States and is actually 500 megapixels or so, something like that. And yeah, sure, these aren't just 500 megapixels. These are 500 megapixels over which a fully convolutional neural net, if you know what that is, was applied at scale. And it was done in about two hours, which is amazing. Um, to, because you know, kind of bringing this back to land cover maps, these are things that historically take five years to build for one year. And once we talk about scaling up our ability to apply inference, it's a big data problem, right? This isn't just an Earth Engine large catalog problem. This is an Earth Engine with a big catalog with a big computation problem. And to actually scale these types of predictions over the world, we have to get a little bit smarter. And David is going to tell us how we got smarter using Cloud Platform. So now that we had a, a train model, uh, we need to do predictions at scale. So the Earth is big, it's really big. <laughs> and we have Landsat 8 satellite images uh, for the entire world for every 16 days since uh, 2013 at that 30 meter resolution. That's a lot of data. So how do we do the, these predictions at scale with so much data? Uh, first, we have to subdivide the world into smaller regions. Now, the cool thing is that every individual region is independent from each other, so they can be run in parallel. So let's say we want to classify this location. Uh, the first step would be identifying which region contains this location, and then we can run the classification only on that region. So let's look into more detail at how we do this. Um, first, we have an App Engine server uh, into which we submit that location, and then it computes the bounds of the region uh, that contains that location, uh, which is then submitted into Earth Engine. 
Earth Engine now extracts this region and it gets stored into cloud storage. So this is how the Landsat 8 image looks like, or at least that's what our eyes can see. This is the RGB representation of it. And it's kind of hard to tell what is what. Everything looks kind of greenish, so we don't know if it's exactly like grassland or forest or even water. Fortunately, Landsat 8 comes with very sophisticated sensors that can see a broader uh, range of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes cannot see, such as infrared and even thermal information. Uh, and all of these uh, gives a signature to each of the material um, that makes it easier for our model to identify what kind of material is within each pixel. Uh, so as we can see now uh, in these uh, other bands of the, of the non-visible spectrum, uh, things like water and concrete stand out a lot more uh, than the, in the previous image. So as, as these uh, Landsat images are extracted, parts of them are written into cloud storage. As these files are written, they trigger a cloud function uh, that does a request to a Kubernetes cluster running our TensorFlow model to do the predictions. And these predictions are at a file level. And once they are classified, they are now stored uh, once again into cloud storage. This is what the prediction for that area looks like. And as we can see, every single pixel has a value for one out of 10 possible classes. Uh, as these land cover files are written into cloud storage, those trigger another cloud function that tells our server to upload that image back into Earth Engine, uh, where it gets stored into an image collection which contains the land cover maps for the entire world for all the years that we've extracted. Now, these land cover maps are very useful for decision makers and other organizations to make more informed decisions about what, I what resources are in the Earth. And every pixel tells a story, especially when we see the change. Um, now, one of the very cool things about Earth Engine is that uh, once the data is in Earth Engine, it's not only visible within Earth Engine, but it's also accessible to other external applications. Uh, which made it possible for us to bu build a custom web application using AngularJS and Maps API to request both the land cover images and the Landsat images and then render them into uh, our application. So let's take a look at some locations. Here uh, we are in Cambodia. Um, what we can see here as the, as the uh, dark green, that's forest. And all that amber, yellowish uh, thing, that's farmland. And if you pay attention to the uh, cent central region of that uh, forest, if we turn on the animation from 2013 to 2018, uh, we can see how that uh, farmland is slowly eating through this protected land. Uh, land cover makes it easier to quantify, but if we uh, choose the Landsat images, then we can clearly see how this is affecting some uh, very important habitats uh, in Cambodia. Now, uh, we can also uh, check this. Uh, now, we can go into the Amazon. This is Peru. Uh, and we see this thing that looks kind of like a fat uh, river that is uh, going down. And if we turn the animation on, uh, then we'll see a very interesting thing that this is growing and kind of flowing as if a new river was, going, uh, was being created. Well, this is not actually a river. This is toxic waste and, and heavy metal residues coming from a, a mine nearby. Fortunately, some researchers in Peru are uh, looking at, some, at trees and plant species that can grow in these hazardous environments to help clean up the area. And now, if we go all the way to Iran, this is Lake Ormia, the largest lake in Iran. And we can see how the water levels uh, is decreasing. And this is due to the construction of dams and the effects of global warming. Uh, in fact, that little uh, green patch that we see nearby the water, that used to be an island surrounded by water. So as we can see, these land cover maps tell us a story and have a lot of very uh, insightful information uh, about the regions that help us quantify what's happening in there. Uh, 
but they take a lot of time and effort to create this. Uh, in fact, uh, to create a, a map of the entire USA, it takes at least five years uh, to create one of these. So we tried generating the maps for the entire United States, and we managed to get the maps uh, from 2013 to 2018 in under 24 hours. <laughs> so let me show you a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, what we're doing to the forest in the world is but a mirror reflection of what we are doing to ourselves and to one another. Uh, but it's not all bad news. There's also a bunch of very cool efforts that are happening around the world. Um, <laughs> Whoop. Something's not working. There we go. <laughs> so for example, uh, this is the Great Green Wall uh, project that is happening in Africa. This is in conjunction with a bunch of different countries and communities working together to plant a lot of trees and edible plants uh, to create a division between the now growing Sahara Desert and protect the forests uh, in Africa. And there are also some reforestation efforts going in, Am in the Amazon where people are gathering seeds from the forests around them and then mixing them with soil and planting in affected areas. Uh, here we can see how the, these plants look like after three to six months of growing and then these trees after uh, five to seven years of growing. Uh, we all share the same planet and every little action like using less plastic or growing your own food will have an impact. If you like this project or, see, or would like to see how it was created, you can follow this link uh, and it'll take you to our GitHub repo uh, or you can share the story in Medium. Thank you. <laughs>